Hello, welcome very much uh, to this uh, session on the Nobel Prize in uh, Economics. On the website you can choose to follow a stream in English or a stream in Korean, so pick your language of preference there. You can also uh, post some questions uh, on the Slido function that you find on, on the website. Uh, so please do that, we invite you to. Um, I am not going to open this uh, session, but uh, the ambassador to, to Swe the ambassador of Sweden, the ambassador of Sweden to S the Republic of Korea, <laughs> Jakob Hagen. I'm saying this so many times that I'm forgetting you. Very welcome. Anders, uh, it's uh, it's really great. We've already had a session this afternoon or this morning, depending where you are on the sciences, and now we're turning uh, to the next topic this afternoon, which is the economics uh, session in this uh, Nobel Memorial Prize or Nobel Memorial Program 2020. This is the first year we do this for the, those of you who have just uh, uh, joined us. Uh, and the title for this section, uh, session or symposia as we call it, is the quest for the perfect auction, reflecting this year's Nobel, Nobel Prize, uh, and I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, and what we're going to do today is that we're going to listen to some preeminent and really excellent Korean and Swedish experts and professors, uh, uh, you know, deciphering or explaining in more detail and making it uh, uh, understandable for us who are not the experts about the laureates this year, uh, how they went about when they when they made their their groundbreaking discoveries and and uh, what that meant to maybe relations even between Korea and and Sweden. So you are all welcome to this session, whether you are experts in the field or if you are just like me, curious human beings who are interested in understanding uh, these prices and their significance uh, more. Uh, and uh, this uh, symposia today and the whole program is organized together with some preeminent and really great partners both in Sweden and here in, in Korea and I would like to pay tribute to you because without you this would not have been uh, possible. You've really, you've really supported us in an eminent way and you will hear from some of these partners very soon. So uh, thank you to you and I I really look forward and I hope that you are now uh, comfortable and, and uh, uh, rested and ready and curious for this second session of the Nobel Memorial Program which I declare open now. Back to you Dr. Hector. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Ambassador. Um, we are indebted to uh, several universities. They are tremendously important for international cooperation between our countries. In the next, uh, I'm going to give the word to five uh, universities, one Korean and uh, four, four Swedish, that are very important partners to us uh, in this uh, project. Uh, particularly with the first, uh, I want to uh, highlight the Iwa Women's University, which is where we are at. Uh, the venue is at the Iwa Women's University and they have been very helpful in uh, helping us uh, setting this up and supporting us in, in different ways. So I want to, to introduce to you uh, presentations from these universities, uh, starting with uh, uh, the president of Iwa Women's University, Heisuk Kim, uh, followed by the president of the University of Gothenburg, Eva Viberg. And then we will hear from the president of KTH, Royal Institute of Technology, Sigrid Karlsson, uh, followed by the vice chancellor of Lund University, Torbjörn von Schantz. And the, the last one out will be president of Umeå University, far up north in Sweden, Hans Adolfsson. So please enjoy these presentations and listen carefully because they have important messages for us. Thank you. See you in a while. On behalf of the IWA community, I would like to take this opportunity to sincerely welcome everyone to this online conference 
Sweden-Korea Nobel Memorial Program. I would also like to convey our sincere appreciation to the Swedish Embassy in Korea for organizing this event. Korea has had a long-standing and bountiful relationship with Sweden since 1959. It is thus extremely meaningful that our two nations are collaborating on organizing an event for the first time in Korea to commemorate and celebrate the invaluable significance of the Nobel Prize. It's an honor for IWA to be playing a pivotal role in this momentful event. IWA has continuously interacted with the Swedish institution in various ways. We have welcomed many Swedish students to our campus and sent our students to Sweden. IWA also has the pleasure of welcoming distinguished visitors such as Queen Sylvia and co-hosting the Swedish Film Festival every year to raise greater cultural awareness. I have no doubt in that through this event, IWA will further contribute to strengthening between two nations. I am proud that IWA's Department of Economics is a partner organization for this symposium and this year's Nobel Prize Awards in Economic Sciences. With a long history of producing excellent scholars and with dedicated faculty who are actively leading the field in Korea, the Economics Department has always stood at the forefront of mainstreaming academic excellence and making significant impacts, not only in Korea, but across the world. I hope you will enjoy the symposium today. Opportunities such as these are rare, as it is not every day we have the chances to learn from renowned speakers such as Professor Che Byung-il, President of Korea Foundation for Advanced Studies and Professor of IHWA. I look forward to listening to their insights, as well as the vigorous panel discussion session to follow. I hope many of you will enjoy as well. Thank you. Good morning and good evening, everyone. My name is Eva Weiberg, and I'm the president of the University of Gothenburg. I'm honored and proud that my university is part of this excellent Nobel Memorial Program. And I wish that I could have been with you in person to take part of the presentations. Due to the pandemic, this is of course not possible. The pandemic has brought us many challenges. Perhaps the most important of all for the higher education community is for us to preserve and nurture global conversations, like this one between Sweden and South Korea. The University of Gothenburg is a broad and comprehensive university with a strong research focus. One of our strongest research areas is within political science and in public opinion, democracy and elections. In this field of political science, there is also an established research collaboration with Yonsei University. The collaboration is also strong within education, where the university has exchanged 200 students with Korean universities over the years. We are hoping that this is only the beginning of an intensified collaboration in education and research with the Korean higher education community. The Nobel Prizes are the greatest celebrations of science. In the year of 2000, the same year when Kim Dae-jung from South Korea was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, Arvid Carlson, Professor Emeritus at the University of Gothenburg, was one of three laureates in physiology medicine. A celebration of science, truths and facts, such as the Nobel Prizes, are of increased importance in challenging times when the international community must act jointly to fight a pandemic. It is with pleasure and pride I see the development of this joint collaboration between our two countries. I hope to meet you all in person in Korea during next year's Nobel Memorial Program.
Fetij is happy to be partner in this event. And in times like this, it is even more important to keep connected. KTH is the oldest and largest technical university in Sweden with attractive education and world-leading research. KTH is an international university with some 30% of faculty having international background. Yearly, we have an inflow of about 1,000 international students. Korea is important to KTH for further exchange of students and more of excellent research collaborations. With KTH being an international leading engineering university, we'd like to deepen our collaboration as Korea is a world leading nation in engineering and innovation. I see many similarities and mutual interests. I would like to see more Swedish students going to Korea to tap into the world leading education and research, but also to learn more about the Korean culture. In the coming years, I'd like to see more research collaborations and more of academia and industry collaborations. Being a part of this Nobel Memorial program, I just have to take the possibility to tell you about the real pride for KTH, Hannes Alvén. He is our first but not last Nobel laureate. Professor Alvén got the Nobel Physics Prize in 1970, and he's considered a pioneer in the field of plasma physics, and his discoveries play a crucial role in today's space research. I have visited Korea a couple of times, and it's a fascinating country. Already in 2013, I joined a delegation of Swedish rectors who visited a large number of excellent universities in the Seoul area. I have really enjoyed my stays. I was impressed by the high quality of the universities and the amazing labs for experimental research. I look forward to once again come back to Korea in real life. For us at KTH, this event is an opportunity to further engage KTH in deeper discussions to increase the ties with your wonderful country. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Lund University, it is an honor to welcome you today to this Nobel Memorial Symposium. As two of the world's most innovative countries, Sweden and South Korea have a great deal to learn from each other and many reasons to cooperate. Learn and cooperate on emerging technologies, digitalization and AI and sustainability issues, to name just a few areas. South Korea inspires us in many ways. One example is the large investment in electric roads that Sweden is now making, such as the Evolution Road project here in Lund. This was all inspired by the work KAST has done with inductive electric roads, the so-called OLEV project. So collaboration with South Korea is important to Lund University. Last year, we decided on an action plan for collaboration with Asia, and South Korea occupies a prominent place in this work. Here in Lund, we host two of the most advanced research infrastructure projects in Northern Europe, MAX4 and the European Spallation Source. Such facilities provide a strong foundation for furthering research cooperation with South Korea. It is my hope that the Nobel Memorial Symposia will stimulate increased scientific ties between our countries and between individual researchers. I am glad that you are joining us for this event and I wish you all success. Dear friends of Korea and Sweden, Greetings from Umeå and Umeå University. My name is Hans Adelsson and I'm the Vice Chancellor at Umeå University. And as the university, we are very happy to be part of the Swedish-Korean Nobel Memorial Program today. Umeå University has been collaborating with the Swedish Embassy in Seoul since 2013. We currently have seven partner universities in Korea and would like to establish additional partnerships and to extend the relationships regarding research collaborations. Umeå University's strong research areas include, for example, global health, infection biology, plant and forest biotechnology, aging and population studies, and research connected to the Arctic regions. 
My personal professional background is within chemistry, and therefore I am especially proud that the groundbreaking discovery which is awarded this year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry began at a laboratory here at Umeå University. The CRISPR-Cas9 genetic scissors, one of the gene technology's sharpest tools, was discovered by Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. At the time of the discovery, Emmanuel Charpentier was a group leader here at MIMS, the Laboratory of Molecular Infection Medicine Sweden at our university, in fact, over there. She often mentions Umeå as a place where she really could focus on her research and that it was a great platform for networking and sharing ideas. I personally had the opportunity to visit Seoul in 2014 and it was a great experience. Therefore, I also look forward to visiting Korea again and hopefully next year's Nobel Memorial Program can take place in Seoul. So, with that, enjoy today's meeting and do take care. Thanks. Thank you very much for those uh, words from universities in Sweden and in Korea. And they really confirm to us that Korea is important to Sweden. There's no hesitation about that. This session is about the economic sciences, the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. It's a special prize because uh, in different ways, it's uh, the only one that's uh, in the social sciences. And it's come, uh, myself coming from the social sciences, I would say it's the most important of the Nobel Prize categories. Um, for the reason that uh, it awards achievements to understand and describe how we build the societies that we live in and what could possibly be more important than that, I ask. Our first speaker uh, will be Professor Olof Johansson Stenman. The economy is more than the utility maximizing rational decision maker to Olof Johansson Stenman. People care greatly for things like equality, fairness, moral, social norms. And this is keeping Professor Johansson Stenman busy and he will talk about the price in economy and about how economics can contribute to a better world. A very warm welcome to Professor Olof Johansson Stenman. Thank you for this introduction and thank you all for organizing this. Uh, so good morning and good evening. I would just like to reiterate that it would of course have been even more fun and enjoyable being in Korea. I've been there three times before, and both Seoul and, and, and other places of Korea, and I've thoroughly enjoyed each of those times a lot. Uh, so that uh, the, the um, I will talk about economics for the greatest benefit to humankind. Uh, I'm Olaf Johansson Stenman, Professor of Economics, including Behavioral, Public and Environmental Economics at the University of Gothenburg. So, uh, broadly, the structure of uh, my talk will be as follows. I will start by saying something fairly brief about this year's Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel, as it is formally called, which I will refer to the Nobel Prize in Economics from now on. Uh, after that, I will talk about the role and importance of research in the economic sciences more broadly, and even more broadly in the social sciences in order to contribute to a better world. Finally, I will say a little bit about different kinds of research and economics, including kinds that has been awarded the Nobel Prize before concluding. So, as you all know, uh, the Nobel Prize in Economics 2020 was awarded jointly to Professors Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson for improvements to auction theory and inventions of new auction formats. They have thus studied very intensively how auction work and also how they ought to work. They have also used their insights to design new auction formats, both for goods, but also, and even more so, for services that are difficult to sell in a traditional way, for example, radio frequencies. Uh, as a consequence, their discoveries have benefited both sellers, 
buyers, but perhaps even more importantly, taxpayers around the world. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the first application was in 1994 when the US authorities first used one of their auction formats to sell radio frequencies to telecom operators. But since then, many other countries have, have followed in that development and there are many, many examples of auctions like that. I think it is perhaps particularly interesting to note that as is often the case in natural sciences, uh, that their research started out with fundamental theory and later used their results in practical applications, which I don't think they really could have understood at the time where they made their more basic and fundamental discoveries. Uh, and these applications have then, as you know, then subsequently spread globally. And I would like to um, highlight uh, the similarities with natural sciences in, in this regard. And that I think is well known. There is, of course, con constantly almost a discussion whether it's too much or too little based uh, spent on basic sciences compared to applied sciences. I will not say much about that, but, but almost everybody realizes that also fundamental and basic sciences has a very important role to play. Uh, but it's, I think it's less known within the social sciences, including the economic sciences. And I think that's a pity. I think it's very important that, that um, it becomes more well known, that also in the social sciences it's important not only to focus on specific applications, because there are fundamental breakthroughs and method developments, etc., which are essential for uh, those subsequent uh, applications, and which are typically not known when uh, the discoveries of those fundamental uh, discoveries are made. So, uh, what is economics or economic sciences really? That's a question that one might ask oneself because quite often um, economists and uh, of various kinds apply their knowledge and methods to all kinds of applications. And there is no doubt that the subject has been much broadened in recent years or even decades. Meaning that the, the, the question, what really is economics, has been typically become more difficult to answer. Indeed, I would say it's, it's often quite unclear whether certain research is economics, political science, psychology, archaeology, history, sociology, statistics, or something else. In my mind, this is a very positive development. Uh, it, it's, it, it may be a little bit difficult to categorize things and that may cause some problems for people to, in order to, to, to put labels on things. But overall, I think it's very good that disciplinary borders uh, are crossed increasingly. Uh, and I think it's scientifically sound that methodologies from different scientific disciplines, backgrounds and, and traditions are applied to similar problems. Uh, beyond that, of course, sometimes it's furthermore very important to combine efforts from different disciplines and work together in, in, in a multi- or, or, or transdisciplinary effort. But regardless of that, even, even uh, when the scientific endeavor is taking place within a certain disciplines, I think it's sound that one should not feel that this is not my area or that is for someone else and so forth, regardless of which discipline we're talking about. Nevertheless, uh, regardless of what we call it, economics or something else, is this kind of social science research really that important? Um, before answering this, uh, I would like to highlight the enormous progress that has been made in the natural sciences. Indeed, I think it's fair to say that we now have scientific and technological knowledge to deal with and actually solve major challenges of the humankind, including the poverty issues. We know how to produce sufficient food on Earth, no doubt about that. Tropical diseases such as malaria, dengue fever or what have you. 
we know basically how we could deal with that. Environmental problems, including climate change, we have technological solutions to take care of that. We don't apply it, but we have it. Natural resource scarcity, we know how to substitute natural resources to, 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 to renewable ones to deal with that essentially. Yet, despite having sufficient knowledge in the natural science sense and technological capabilities, none of these problems is still solved. And some of them are actually getting worse over time, as we speak. Thus, it is not sufficient with natural science knowledge. We also need systematic knowledge of the society at large, including what drives individual behavior, firm behavior, and different institutions, including the political systems. Consequently, I argue, we also desperately need the social and economic sciences. Of course, this does not mean that we, there are any sort of quick fix to solve all of those problems, but we need the knowledge and analysis. There are also some important social problems where natural science perhaps cannot contribute that much. We have problems of racism, political populism, some would argue that it's increasing the problem of political populism uh, around the world. Uh, segregation, huge problems within many countries. Uh, and even more obvious examples such as wars, including the risk of nuclear wars. These are essential problems to deal with. Of course, no easy problem to solve by any means, but knowledge in dealing with them, in understanding the underlying mechanism and how to deal with them is essential. In some fields, the connections between natural and social sciences are particularly important, I think. You can think of problems such as anti uh, antibiotic resistance, an increasing problem around the world, uh, virus protection, uh, not least important these days, of course, uh, food regulation, how that would work, climate policy, issues such that where, where neither natural science nor social sciences by themselves are of course sufficient. We need the cooperation in order to deal with those problems in an effective way. Um, now I will I will talk a little bit of different kinds of of economics within the economic sciences or economics. The quantitatively dominating part, and increasingly so in recent years and decades, is empirical. As you realize, I think empirical research is, is um, to some extent uh, a larger challenge within the social sciences compared to natural sciences. It's harder to make uh, controlled experiments, for example. I will come back to that issue. Um, some of the issues we are really important, uh, that are really important, that we really would like to measure, are very difficult to measure. And unfortunately, often the issues that we really care very much about are hard to measure. Uh, how does economic growth or GDP relate to higher education and research? That's obviously important. Uh, how does democracy relate to economic pro progress? Uh, does growth decrease with the amount of redistribution through the tax system? Or maybe the other way around, and maybe it's context dependent. Many of those answers are, in fact, context-dependent, according to present research. And even more broadly, what are the most important determinants of human well-being? It's so clearly not only material well-being, right? But, but what should we aim at maximizing in some broad sense? So. There is often a trade-off, and, and what we can measure quite well are, unfortunately, often not the issues that we care very much about, but, but and there are, of course, a green scale, a number of issues are important and possible to measure to various extent. Um, a 
as I mentioned, it is typically harder in the social sciences to conduct controlled experiments compared to natural sciences. Uh, although one should say that it is not always easy in the natural science either, of course. I mean, we can think of astronomy, for example, where, where clearly you cannot hardly, at least most in most cases, you cannot make make, uh, make controlled experiments. Uh, within the social sciences, it increasingly used uh, controlled experiments of various kind. Indeed, Bernard Smith got the Nobel Prize 2002 for having established laboratory experiments as a tool in empirical economic analysis. And since then, and even before then, uh, it has uh, grown dramatically the use of uh, what we call laboratory uh, experiments, which are not laboratory in the, in the physical sense, but, but uh, they are laboratory in the sense that you... Uh, and the, uh, the motivation underlying ex uh, experiments are, of course, the same as in the natural science. You would like to keep things constant that you are not directly measuring. That's the idea for experiments everywhere, and this is the idea also within the economic sciences and in the social sciences. Uh, there are, of course, pros and cons of that. Uh, there is, a, compared to the natural sciences, um, in the natural sciences, a molecule would hardly think, hmm, am I part of an experiment now? Maybe I will act differently than I would do otherwise. But there is a risk that human subjects would act like that. Uh, so there are other kinds of experiments as well taking place. In, in 2019, for example, the Nobel Prize in Economics was awarded to Esther Duflo, Abhijit uh, Banerjee and Michael Grimer for their work adapting the methods of what is called randomized control trials, a kind of field experiments uh, to the field of development, including problems re related to starvation and also basic education, for example. And an advantage with this kind of experiment is that then you're adapting them without the subjects being, uh, being uh, uh, understanding they are, that they are part of an experiment. So they would typically then behave in, in, in a more uh, realistic way compared to how they would do otherwise. But there are, of course, pros and cons of many kinds. Uh, in fact, my conjecture is that we will also soon have a, a Nobel Prize related to so-called natural experiments or quasi-experiments, uh, uh, by which we mean methods to identify naturally occurring phenomena where data takes the form as if it would have been constructed by an experiment. We will see. That's my conjecture. And that's a, that's a field within the social sciences where there is much progress taking place in, in the recent years, where where, where the improvements, uh, the possibilities for, to make uh, causal inference are are are, are uh, that's the major advantage compared to more controlled structural approaches. Or so. uh, nevertheless. Um, I would say empirical challenges in order to obtain causal relationships that we would like to have, of course, prevail. Uh, okay. Perhaps contrary to common perception, uh, much less resources are spent on forecasting the future. Uh, sometimes economists get the rumor for being what sort of economists deal with trying to predict the future, which is what very few economists or, or social scientists generally deal with, actually. And it's, of course, super difficult to do that. Yet, even though it is very difficult, it is also very important, not least in the long run. For example, what are the likely impacts in terms of climate change and corresponding social impacts, given that we follow certain policy trajectories worldwide? Those are super important questions, I argue, even though we, of course, realize that we will be wrong in our forecast, it will be impossible to predict the future, but in order to contemplate and reflect over different possibilities depending on how we act today uh, uh, regarding the implications for the future, I think it's very important. Beyond empirical research, we also have research based on theoretical or deductive models. And even more so, I would say, compared to our sister uh, social sciences. These models are often highly stylized in many dimensions in order to highlight some specific mechanism of interest. 
they are often useful to understand puzzles or patterns in the society that at first glance may be difficult to understand. A uh, famous old one is the diamond water paradox. Uh, we all need water to survive, no one needs diamonds to survive. Uh, still, diamonds are more expensive than water. Why is that? It may sound like a silly or trivial question, but it actually took uh, uh, quite some, some time before uh, arriving is what is now uh, uh, thought of as being a roughly correct understanding of the underlying mechanism. Other questions are, why is not the unemployment rate higher in countries where more robots are used? Since robots replace uh, labor, uh, uh, human beings in factories worldwide, uh, one would think that where you use more robots, then you should have more unemployment. But that is typically not the, place when, uh, the case when you look at it empirically. Why is that? Of course, there are theories understanding that, but at the first glance, it's not obvious why, or might not be obvious. Uh, returning to the global warming issue is one of the major challenges, of course, that we face as humanity today. Given the overwhelming scientific evidence of global warming, uh, in, including insights that the problems can actually be solved at rather low or at least modest costs, how come we have not? It is many forecasts from IPCC, for example, would say if you would implement a carbon tax worldwide, would, 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 that would be at the level of the Swedish CO2 tax for consumers today. We would solve it, essentially. This is not taking place clearly. Why? Related to that, of course, Will, William Nordhaus got the Nobel Prize 2018 for his work on integrating climate change into long-run macroeconomic analysis, explaining both, in a sense, why it's not taking place and how one could analyze it in, in, in order to gain insights in how to deal with that in, in, in a rational way. Um, another challenge or, or puzzle is that, uh, the fact that According to the simple heckscher ulin model that you may have heard of, or the model of comparative advantages that almost everybody has heard of, I think, where the idea is that you have different comparative advantages in different countries, hence there is uh, gains from trade due to that. And that would suggest that the more different countries are, uh, the more gains would be uh, achieved by trade. Uh, yet, if you look at it empirically, it turns out that more similar countries are trading much more to each other compared to different countries. Why is that? It took some time to realize that as well, actually. Uh, and uh, actually, there was also this insight, understanding that uh, was, I think, a major reason why Paul Krugman got the Nobel Prize 2008 for his so-called new trade theory. Uh, that could credibly explain why these two related puzzles occur based on very stylized, in some sense, sophisticated mathematical models, but very stylized and simplified frameworks in order to show the essence of this model, in order to understand the underlying puzzles. Uh, more, moreover, in economics, uh, we also have explicitly normative models, and that is also worth mentioning, I think. For example, how should the government's income tax system be structured, taking into account both distributional and incentive aspects simultaneously? Questions like that uh, was, uh, I think, the major reason why James Murleys was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1996 for his contribution to solving these problems analytically, or at least shed uh, uh, much light on these problems, and I think the the, the benefits to, to actually to humankind from the insights from this subset of literature is actually enormous. All of course very difficult to quantify. Similarly, how should environmental degradation be regulated or taxed? This I think might also be awarded uh, prize in Paris. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in the not too distant future, but we will see. Uh, 
Another is to should technological development and research, I mean, we're talking about universities, should they be subsidized? And if so, how and how much? And related to the price of this year, should the fifth generation licenses uh, be auctioned that are taking place all over the world now, right? And, and if they should be auctioned, if how should they be done related to, again, the, the price of this year? Now, in the broader sense, one might ask oneself, uh, are such questions scientific or are they simply political or perhaps more philosophical? Uh, can such analysis be intersubjective, as we call it, and hence replicable? I argue that the answer is yes. And the reason is that we will then have to start with explicitly assumed social objectives. This is an assumption. And given explicit assumption, both about the behavior of different agents in the economy and society at large, any other researcher can replicate the deductive reasoning and the analysis. Hence, I do not argue that we should uh, keep these type of questions for, for either solely for moral, moral philosophy, although I think moral philosophy is an important insight into the, the, the scientific community, of course, including economics, nor do I think that we should say that these questions are not uh, scientific, uh, so the questions per se, per se should be left to policymakers. <clears throat> it's sometimes argued that, that science should only say if you do this and this, this might happen. If you do that, that will happen, then the policymakers will choose. Of course, that is often the case, and this is of course an important part of science to understand how things are, to answer the is questions. Uh, or why questions, and not the ought question. So I, again, would like to uh, emphasize that I agree with uh, David Hume's famous statement, or what is assumed to say anyway, that you, should, you cannot derive an ought from an is. Nevertheless, we can make assumptions that make it possible also to systematically and scientifically answer ought questions, which are then, of course, uh, dependent on the assumptions made, as all other theoretical research within science. Uh, okay. So, finally and overall then, in my mind, there is no doubt that the economic sciences and social sciences more generally have a very important role to play. Uh, perhaps we'll, we'll have an even more important role to play in the future in applying a variety of scientific methods, where I have just, I have just touched upon the few actually, in order to contribute to a better world. Thank you very much for listening. Oh, thank you very much. Professor, thank you very much for that uh, expose. It was uh, very interesting and there were several questions that I would like to come back to in a while. But first I would like to introduce our second speaker today. Uh, Byung Il Che is professor at Iwa Women's University, which is here where we are, uh, but it's at the Graduate School of International Studies. But he's also, and more actively today, president of Korea Foundation for Advanced Studies. They are committed to promoting national growth through academic development. And among the things that they do are to send the brightest students to top international universities, which seems very worth <clears throat> Excuse me. President Che is very familiar with uh, one of the two winners, Professor Milgram, uh, from having worked with him in the US. We will now hear about the winners and about uh, how their work manifests uh, the spirit of economics to solve real world problems. A most warm welcome to you, Professor Byung Il Che. And please uh, stand or sit uh, as you feel is best, or English or Korean. Uh, I will use both. <clears throat> 네, 감사합니다. Uh, 이와대학... 
Thank you very much. I am a professor at Iwa Women's University, and I have attended many conferences at this hall. But uh, it's a great honor for me to be part of this Nobel Memorial Program held together with Sweden. I was the first Korean student to be taught by uh, Professor Paul Milgram. And it's been 30 years. I still maintain my relationship as a mentor student. And also, I am great friends with him. And I would like to talk about uh, his personal side and also the great contribution that Professor Milgram made. So it was Professor Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson who were the uh, Nobel laureate and their teacher-student relationship. Uh, Professor Milgram was not interested in getting a degree. He graduated from Michigan University. He worked as an accountant and went to San Francisco to get a job. And he wanted to advance in his career, so he went to Stanford University. There he met uh, his mentor, Professor Robert Wilson. It was his first year of study, and Professor Wilson said, you are such a brilliant student. Why don't you start your PhD program? And so his life took a turn. And I don't know, maybe because of this, I call Professor Milgram by his first name. I call him Paul. He has achieved a lot. And he it was possible because he was a great mathematician and he was a great theorist. But he also excelled in applying the theory to practice. And when the theory did not work in practice, he tried to revise the theory and uh, applied it to problem solving. We are talking about economics, as was mentioned by Professor Stenman. Economic science, uh, it is part of social sciences. Uh, we, in, we don't call humanities humanities sciences. We don't include the word science in humanities. So how to define science and what is not science? When explaining a phenomenon and uh, in anticipating a phenomenon, is there a set of tools? Is there a vocabulary set that can be used by the people? In that sense, I think the economics is science because there is the demand and supply. There is the concept of the market. And when the phenomenon happens, if is it whether efficient or not? There's the concept of efficiency. All economic majors learn about efficiency. And the PhD programs in the US and in the UK train the students about the concept of efficiency. So when the economists look at a certain phenomenon, they know by reflex whether there is efficiency or not. So when we talk about auctions, the two Nobel laureates uh, won the award for the auction theory. Auctions have been around as long as the humans have been around. In the monarchies, there was the slave market, and the slaves were traded by the auction system. And in many countries now, uh, the mining rights and uh, the exploration and production rights for oil, there are many ways of allocating the rights. Uh, you could uh, give the right to someone who's close to power, or you could have the draw, or you could have the auction to designate the people to do the business. The auctions have been around because there have been many theories developed about the auction. And when the assets were sold off in auctions, there was the belief that there was this efficiency. And so professors Milgram and Wilson pulled this off. When we talk about auctions, if we write it out in Korean, uh, there is the Chinese characters competitive bidding. So if I want to get a product through an auction, I have to bid uh, for a higher price. And when I write a 
higher price, then I fall into the winner's curse because uh, the price is inflated. And in Korea in 2014, in the uh, month of September, near the Samsung subway station, the land of Kepco was auctioned. It was a closed, sealed bidding, and the land was awarded to Hyundai Motors, and they paid three times uh, the land price that was appraised by the authority. And so the stock price of Hyundai Motors fell, and six years have passed, and their stock prices have not recovered. Of course, in the long run, they did write down a price far uh, more pro expensive than the appraisal price. And so they could uh, come out as a winner, creating more value. Uh, the, the economics is a political economy. And in Korea, uh, economics is considered as a uh, body of uh, knowledge that can save the people from economic turmoil. The economists uh, should not concentrate too much on political economy, and they should not just focus on the theoretical aspect, researching locked up in their ivory towers. And so they lose their sense of reality at the Korea Foundation of Advanced Studies, uh, we were thinking of the same thing. I wanted to uh, inspire more Korean scholars. And uh, K. Foss has produced 800 plus PhD graduates. And uh, we have uh, produced a video, The Way to Stockholm, uh, K Foss has a YouTube channel, and I am explaining the auction theory to one of the students who came to interview me. The major contribution of professors Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson is in the frequency uh, bidding. The frequencies allow the smartphones to work. They are invisible, but without the resources, we cannot use the phones. The frequencies are owned by the government, and who should the government give the frequency rights to? In the 1980s, the same question arose, and the same question arose again in the 1990s. In the beginning, what they did in the US was the Federal Communication Commission, FCC, in the 1980s had uh, given out the frequencies through lottery. They thought it was the most fair method. And I returned to Korea, and I was advisor to the Minister of Information and Communication. And Korea was interested in frequencies. And so many companies wanted to own the frequencies to be able to uh, become a telecom operator. And the Korean government uh, asked the companies to submit uh, business documents, and the business proposals were reviewed. And in return, uh, the frequencies were allocated. As an advisor and as an economist, I proposed the idea of auction. And the response I got was, auctions are all about rich people buying things uh, for a higher price, and it's not fair. So people did not trust the auction system. And fast forward 2020, Korea is auctioning off frequencies. And so the economists used the economics to solve real world problems. And that's how the scene has changed. Professor Milgram's way of auctioning uh, radio frequencies. Why was this innovative? In 1994, when FCC auctioned the frequencies, they divided the US into different blocks. And they did the simultaneous multiple round auction to reduce the winner's curse. It meant that more people uh, remained in the auction. And the government could also raise 
uh, more profits. So it benefited all the players. It was not perfect from the very beginning. Paul said that uh, you know there are so many unexpected variables, and every time he came across that, he fixed them. He was humble and he was uh, open to changing and bending his ideas and theories, and. Uh, he was a great advisor, a mentor, and he also taught me the importance of group work. Uh, this uh, picture is 11 years ago. This is the residence of Professor Milgram. Uh, the young gentleman is my son. He graduated from UC Berkeley, and it was after his graduation ceremony. I went to Berkeley to attend my son's graduation, and Professor Milgram found out, and he said he will throw a party. And so we went to his residence near Stanford, uh, one hour away from Berkeley. I came back to Korea in 1989, but he still inspires me to this day. I had studied game theory and informatics. I was always interested in trade negotiation and telecom issues. And I applied economics learning to real world problems. And Professor Milgram uh, said that you are a student who is not putting to practice the game theory and the auction theory, but he always praised me for being an innovate, for being innovative, and I was inspired. Other than auction theory, Professor Milgram has made contributions. I was lucky enough. I, wa I was taught by Professor Schiller, Professor Tobin, and Professor Nordhaus. They are all Nobel economic laureates, and I was lucky to listen to their classes. And Professor Milgram and Bank Thompson, his colleague in MIT, in the 1980s when they were young economists, in the US, there was the information economics revolution that was taking place. And what this was, was when there was an auction the how much value does this product have to me? Then I can participate in the auction. But if I want to win the bid, I also have to know what the others are offering as their bidding price. Every Everyone has uh, this asymmetrical information, so people have different levels of expectations. And this is the strategic competition and this element was reflected in his theory, and this became game theory. And looking at the organization, there's the hierarchical structure. At the embassy, there's the ambassador, and then the counselor, and the staff. And so when there is a decision to be made, the ambassador's decisions, w uh, will the staff and the counselors know everything? If the, everything was no, maybe people will not be telling the truth, and the facts may be uh, inflated, and there could be abuse and misallocation of assets and resources, and that is the core of economics. The economics theory before the 1980s, there it uh, they put aside the information asymmetry. They didn't think that was important. And the reason being maybe they didn't have the tools to research that. But Professor Wilson and Milgram, they began to study and pri uh, prioritize the information asymmetry. And uh, Professor Milgram has done a lot of research on uh, auction theory, and one of the books came out uh, titled Putting Auction Theory to Work. When Professor Milgram came to Korea 10 years ago, uh, he, I think he was reminded of the information economics revolution. I uh, listened to his lecture for the first time, Advanced Economics in a Yale, and it was there was a big round table in a large lecture hall, and there were more professors than students. 
and there were law school professors, business school professors, and economics professors. Why were the professors there listening to a lecture? Because they felt that there was a paradigm shift, to quote Thomas Kuhn. They wanted to use that in their uh, theories. I think that's the difference between the Western scholars and the Korean scholars. The Korean scholars are too busy. We have to meet the deadlines, write papers, and they cannot think out of their uh, routine work. But the pioneers, even though they're busy, uh, the advanced uh, scholars, they want to learn, they want to get ahead, and they want to uh, increase and deepen their uh, study. And I think I made a contribution in that regard. Professor Milgram's exam, I was the only one taking the exam. Uh, many students dropped out, and of course, the professors don't take tests. But I didn't do well on the final exam. I had so many questions, and Professor Milgren always welcomed me, the student with the most questions. And so I became his favorite student. I was not a super smart student. I was the student with the most number of questions. And so Professor Milgram wrote this in the book for byung -il, who was there at the start. So I was there at the scene of the information economics revolution. I showed this to my friends uh, when I started the YouTube uh, channel, and they said this book will sell for a very expensive price if you auction it. And I put it aside very safely in my bookcase. I have a very unique experience. Uh, when the Korean professors retire at the age of 65, the students get together and they throw a celebration party and uh, they, we uh, provide the collected papers uh, to the professor. And surprisingly, uh, in the US, there is also the retirement party for the professors. When Professor Milgram reached the age of 65, uh, the colleagues threw him a retirement party. So what they did was for one night and two days, uh, the people gathered to read papers and discuss uh, their latest findings, and I was invited. I uh, gave him a present. It was a nameplate made in a mother of pearl, and his name was written in English and in Korean in the back. And Professor Milgram told me that he, this nameplate is in his office where everyone can see it. At 2 a.m., uh, they heard the news that they won the Nobel laureate. And when they woke up, they put on their masks and they posed in front of the camera. When you search on the YouTube, uh, there's this gray-haired man knocking on the door. We may not understand because you would think that he was one of the nominees and he would have his phone turned on and expecting the Nobel Prize. And the Nobel Prize was long overdue. Paul Milgram's colleagues had received Nobel Prize. And uh, Professor Robert Wilson is a nice guy who loves his students, who is a mentor. And uh, Professor Wilson's uh, final exam was too difficult. Out of a perfect score of 100, the students would get 10 points. At best, the two professors were co-winners of Nobel uh, Economics Prize, and this was great news. And there was praise. Uh, the four gentlemen here are all Nobel laureates. Bob Wilson, he's 80-something, and the rest are his students from Stanford and Elvin Ross in 2011 for mapping theory and on the right side, Ben Holmstrom from MIT 
And then there is Paul Milgram. They're all student teacher relationship. They're great economists. And but they're greater than great economists. They began something. They have begun the information economics and they're solving real world problems and they know how the theories work in the real world. And so uh, con in congratulating Professor Milgram's uh, Nobel Prize, I would like to inspire the young Korean scholars. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Shea. That was very interesting to, f thank you for sharing this uh, personal experience of yours with Professor Milgram. I think that's very important. And I'm going to have some questions about the significance of being two, of having a research partner that you're working close with as well. But first I would like, I'm inviting to, to the stage a, a guest that is joining us for the panel discussion. And I'm very happy to, to introduce to you Professor Insil E. Uh, she is a professor of economics at Sogang University. Uh, professor Yi has also worked at, uh, in a public agency and, and in, in industry so you have a broad broad background which is uh, uh, an important uh, um, uh, ability to have uh, important to have that kind of experience as an economist I can imagine you're very welcome professor e. Hi. very nice to have you here please have should I sit down uh, good afternoon my name is Yin Shil. I'm from Sogang University I'm professor Choi talked about many uh, topics and when I was leaving to study, leaving the country to study for my PhD, my father told me that I should win the Nobel Prize in Economics, but four of the professors from whom I have learned have won the Nobel Prize and I also was in these lectures when they had won the prize. And what I would like to share with you briefly is so Professor Choi was speaking a bit about economics in Korea, but myself, I'm a woman. There are so few women economists in the feet, uh, in around the world, and I'm also a very rare woman Korean economist. And I believe that there are less than five women economic professors before myself. So. When I first joined the university, I thought I would be teaching students. But before I became a professor, I went through different research institutions at banks and other associations. And my fifth, fifth occupation was at the university. So I have went through many different occupations. So right now, I'm a professor. So that was a rather longer than expected introduction of myself. I, I appreciate that very much. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you uh, as a first uh, question, a very straightforward perhaps, uh, we haven't yet seen uh, a Nobel Prize, uh, a winner in the Nobel Memorial Prize uh, from Korea or, or even from Asia. The closest, uh, I think, is uh, Grameen Bank. Uh, um, he started um, uh, Mohammed Yunus, uh, but he was uh, awarded the prize in uh, peace. Uh, how, how is that? Well, yes, as I said earlier, I wanted to become a laureate myself, but I found that this was not going to be very possible. This study of economics has begun in the West. So that's how it is structured. And the Korean economy has only become one of the top 10 or 12 economies in the world fairly recently. So making theories and applying those theories, it requires quite a long period of time. And in that regard, South Korea and other Asian countries would have had a harder time to develop really significant theories compared to Western countries. But currently, in terms of uh, purchasing power parity, China has already surpassed the United States. And to take that into account, 
I believe that maybe the Nobel Economics Prize will come from Asia or Korea. So Stanman, do you, is this something that you have uh, considered as well, that you have thought about? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I think it's within the social sciences, it's, it is the case that actually uh, the U.S. is quite dominating, I would say, uh, not least within economics. Um, so uh, it is partly, I guess, related to that this is a strong economy. I would not think it's primarily due to the fact that it's a strong economy. They have had the university system, which is fairly open and structured in the sense that has fostered uh, important contributions. Um, so I think uh, in a longer run perspective that we will see a more spread of laureates around the world, partly due to integrating integration and cooperation uh, around the world, also global cooperation within, between, for example, Korean researchers, American one, Euro Korean and European ones, and so forth, and, and, uh, and that uh, major uh, uh, contributions will come out of that. I would also like to say that there are many prominent economists with uh, which, with, a her uh, with, with an Asian heritage, including Korean one, uh, not least working in U.S. actually. So if you look at the top achievers in the United States, also within uh, economics, there is a substantial fraction of those, I would say, with a heritage from Asia, uh, suggesting that it's, uh, I think, the, 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 the university system to some extent that uh, is important. And that is in itself, of course, the restructuring in Asia, not least in China, uh, but also in, in Korea to some extent and, and so forth. So I, I think we will see a broader set of, of, uh, of winners, but also in the gender perspective, actually. Um, and I do think it increases rather rapidly the fraction of female economists around the world and has done so to, to, for some time now. And I think um, there's time lag, of course, from that to Nobel laureates, but I think that too, that will be over time a more even uh, distribution. Professor Chair, uh, it seems to me that uh, Korea is a very interesting um, uh, experimental market for economy, considering the fantastic economic development we have seen uh, over the last uh, decades, and also there is a, a st strong uh, academic tradition in Korea. There's a very strong uh, wanting to learn and to test and to do things. How would you say is the, the, the standard of the economics uh, science, the economics research in Korea? I'm guessing you would need to have track on that since you are sending people out into the world in important uh, areas. Yes, <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the question. Professor Lee is my senior by a few years. When I entered university, the economics professors at the time could be divided into two groups. The first group has been taught and trained in Korea and or Japan. They would uh, disseminate their knowledge using their lecture notes. It's an imitation of knowledge dissemination. My generation of professors have gone to the top universities. In one year, five to Stanford, five to Yale, and three to Harvard. So my peers and my juniors by a few years they have become more ambitious and they began to be accepted into top schools and they studied non-traditional uh, uh, fields and they did uh, metrics, economic tricks, and many uh, remained in the US. And with lofty causes, they came back to Korea. They didn't just imitate. They added their own flavor. They taught with their own style. And I think this is directly connected to the Korean economic development. In the 60s and in the 70s, Korea 
was walking down a journey without a map, and we followed the way of the Japanese economic development. And then uh, there were people who studied abroad in the US. They followed the industrial policies, but there was the will to economize and the property rights and the contracts were in considered important. And so I think the Korean economics uh, advanced. And now uh, in phase three, um, the juniors, well, there is a lack of depth. But uh, many uh, are competing in the Major League Baseball to make the analogy. And so the current status is we have to branch out and we have to grow further. But my diagnosis is we are stuck. The Korean economy has grown, but there is the internal conflicts that are surfacing. In the Korean economics, it was efficiency driven and economic growth driven. That was the mainstream. And now people are conflicting. Uh, poverty, social divide, income equality, minimum wage. These were not uh, considered the strong points in mainstream economics. Uh, so what I expect from my peers and from my students is uh, you cannot learn it from others' data. It's Korea's own problem, and we have to gather our data. So I think that's where we're struggling at the point. If we can overcome this, I think we can open a new horizon in Korean economics. Otherwise, it will be difficult. In the long term, I am optimistic, but I think in the short term, it is going to be difficult. I am teaching at Iwa Women's University, but the professors uh, are busy trying to fill the score for the annual citation and, you know, they have to publish in uh, impactful journals and they have to conduct joint studies in two or three years, but they don't have the assets and the resources. And so I think this is a serious issue. Professor Wilson and Paul Milgram, they what they did was mechanism design. It was a, an issue of designing the mechanism to solve problems. And the people, uh, they just assume that there is a market. And we have to create a market with our brain without designing the mechanism. And it, this does not involve just the economics. It's uh, inclusive of social sciences and political sciences. And if uh, the social scientists can contribute, uh, then I think there will be good integration of different disciplines. Yeah. Could, could I add on to that point? So I fully agree with the reality that Professor Choi is describing, but I would like to add on a more hopeful note. So. I was the president of the Korea Economic Society until February this year, and we had a lot of communication going out to scholars and a lot of events, and I saw a lot of hope in the field. So, so many academics are under the pressure to get tenure and get promotions, but currently the world is very much interested in the Korean economy and more people are taking a long-term view. I believe that many other professors like yourself are working to solve these issues and I think we are seeing some fruit from those efforts and in particular comparing the quality coming from papers from countries like China even though the quality of papers from China might not be as much as one would expect, there's so much interest in Chinese economy, so many people will be reading the, them. 
But in contrast, uh, Korea, to get published in a prominent journal, you have to be really uh, strategic and political to get published because there is compared relatively less interest in the Korean economy. But now we're seeing better data and uh, computer science and data science advancements are helping our research. And we're also working hand in hand with Chinese researchers. So there is more possibility, there's more potential for Korean economists and scholars to be able to contribute to scholarship around the world. And I was earlier speaking about the possibility of a Korean Nobel Economics Prize risen, and I think that's going to come sooner than one would expect. Hopeful. And I'm, I'm reading in a, a little bit in, in all of your replies and also your presentations that it's not only about uh, the scientific uh, challenges, the scientific problem, it's also about uh, societal challenges. Where we, nobody mentioned the sustainable development goals, but uh, Professor Stenman, you mentioned many, many of the 17 different goals as uh, uh, issues worthy to, to address. And, and you ended with a wrinkle between in your eyes saying, why is that? That's a wonderful, uh, wonderful um, query-driven approach, I think. Uh, but I'm, I'm getting the impression also that, uh, that you, there is some consensus among you that um, uh, economic science is moving in the direction of, of policy or, or taking an interest in policy and what the, the effects uh, of the, the learnings, the knowledge, the results uh, can be, what they can have, such as uh, the results by Professor Milgram and his colleague uh, that ha has had a very, very uh, specific uh, utility in, in society. And, and Professor Stillman, you, you were talking about uh, moving, moving in this uh, ha harder direction for, for a more objective understanding in economic sciences. Are we actually moving uh, in, in such a direction? And, and is, uh, is uh, teaching at universities also supporting this? And are students interested in this? Is this the general trend in the economic sciences? Uh, they are very broad questions, of course. Uh, generally, I would say, uh, starting with the students, they are, I would say, uh, um, earlier on in their development than their teachers, <laughs> such as us, uh, in, 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 I think, overall demanding uh, policy-relevant issues, dealing with the broad social challenges. Uh, uh, there are, I also think, research-wise, we are often earlier than teaching. There is often a time lag uh, when things sort of are, are transformed from research to, to textbooks, etc. So there is a time lag. I think generally there is a role for self-reflection and also self-criticism that we, I think, as a discipline, uh, and I think that actually holds for all social sciences. Uh, are sometimes too slow, too much inward looking uh, in order to, um, and that we should focus even more on the, 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 the large global challenges that faces the world today. And of course there are research like that for sure within all social sciences. Uh, but if I, I sometimes make a thought experiment, if someone would come from, an, from a galaxy far away, uh, coming to Swe uh, coming to the Earth, and they would reflect, uh, they would look into overall the amount of science taking place, including social science, and then they would look at the, what, how much resources are spent on, on different issues. I think their conclusion would be that it's surprising that such a relatively minor part is actually spent on uh, what most people would agree on being the overall very large global challenges that we face today. So uh, there is, uh, I think it's moving in the right direction, uh, but it could be faster. Is it in Korea also moving towards the sustainable development goals and are students also pushing the teachers in front of them, requiring uh, this uh, attention to these areas? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I'd like to share my opinion. The university education 
exactly for that reason is failing. It's becoming like the old days. When I was an economics student, I was frustrated because there were issues, economic issues outside the classroom in the 1970s and in the 1980s. And then inside the classrooms, there were uh, advanced theories being taught. And the discrepancy between the two was too wide. And I was lost. I think similar things are happening. Uh, the economics curriculum in the universities are designed to be conservative. And so the issues of the times, the in inequality, sustainability, income divide, and the major companies in Korea, uh, they consider ESG as important agenda. But in the universities, when teaching social sciences and economics, it's only in the senior year, only in seminars. Uh, there is no intense debate. It's just a passive class. And so the students will not be aware and they won't be well trained and have their thoughts organized. And they become a citizen not being aware of such real world issues. And there is a demand for that. And then there is resistance. Just looking at sustainable development in itself, is this going in the right direction? There is no question about it. But how to get there and how much will it cost? This can be solved by the economics. You can explore options, calculate cost and benefits. And so you need to use the economic tools to solve the problems. But this is not being taught in universities. And if the universities cannot do this, then somebody else will. And that somebody uh, with the uh, objective evidence, it could be a political an activist, I hope that it does not fall into the wrong hands. I So what makes the difference? That will, uh, I think that will be the barometer telling how sound and how healthy the society is. I talked about economics uh, solving real world problems and Professor Lee talked about uh, how Korea's economics compare with the other countries. Economics is a social science. We have to realize that. When we research the economics, it's not uh, simple enough to just explain it with the supply and demand graph. It's the whole society's problem. And we have to collaborate with the political, social, anthropological, students and professors, we need to have interdisciplinary collaboration. But in Korea and in many universities around the world, they only go deep in their own discipline. And so the academic reality and the political realities are too much divided, then we may not be able to attain sustainable development. As an economist, I guess I am only painting gloomy pictures. But if you uh, directly stare into the gloom, you may see the light at the end. Uh, yes, to strike that right balance, I would like to provide the sunny side. So as an economist, of course, this is something that I regret myself as well. Compared to the past, in particular in Korean economic community, how economics are going to be applied. I'm speaking from my own experience, but I do believe that things are improving. Uh, right currently, uh, Korean politics Politics is very much um, undervaluing economics, and as an economist, I'm very uh, frustrated. However, recently, interdisciplinary joint research, a lot of this is taking place. 
if I speak for myself, I'm now beyond filling up a number of uh, citations and churning out papers each year. I speak and work with a lot of people who are not economists, and I learn very much discussing with them. And I believe that it is the same for other economists as well. And here on this panel, we see that these panelists are, are themselves are suggesting many solutions across diverse areas. And economics, uh, economics is a very a structured area of a academia. So a lot of more time is spent on debate and discussion instead of rote learning. It's um, more about um, discussion and more uh, interactive learning. And I believe that there will be much change when we go through this COVID-19 pandemic. In particular, on, at, on the school front, we will see much change. Uh, I would like to see if we have any questions from the audience uh, that uh, can be put up uh, on the screen. Oh, several questions. So which one should we pick? Hmm. Oh, if you, uh, the, the third question from top, if you could share your thoughts on why economics has taken this male dominant characteristic. Professor ah, Lee, yeah. can I direct this question yeah, to you? Yeah, yeah. I had given this a lot of thought, and so I founded the Women Economics uh, Association, and male economists are asking why is there no male economics association, and why do the female scholars have your association? Well, economics uh, itself it has the household as one of the agencies and the pre and the assumption is the agencies are mostly male oriented and so the female gender inclusive economics is necessary and a lot of effort is being being made in that direction so with that perspective Women's welfare is considered important. Low fertility is also a big issue. And economics uh, has been male dominant. And so we have to come up with solutions. I consider this as a serious issue. So female and male economists, I think we have to have a balanced view. So they won't come to the same conclusion. Thank you. Um, we, we are drawing to a close. I can see that. Uh, can I, can I, yeah, please can go I go ahead, Olaf. Very briefly on that. I I think there is. Um, I, I agree with the reflections, but I also think there is, as economics has broadened in recent years, uh, that in itself has, has implied, or at least is correlated with uh, an increased share of women in economics. And if you look at the share of, of, of female researchers within uh, some fields such as environmental economics, behavioral economics, health economics, development economics, labor economics, you see a substantially higher share of of uh, female economists there compared to sort of traditional fields in a sense uh, that you would that, that, that the disciplines were were, were dominated by uh, let's say 40 years ago so so i think there is a for that reason too uh, and that goes in in my mind that both are sound development both the fact that we have that the discipline is broadened but also that in itself also i think contributes to reducing uh, the unfortunate male dominance within economics I think we will need to leave it at that as the last uh, question. Uh, we are already over time, and I would like to have some words also from, from the ambassador. But uh, please uh, thank you so very much, uh, Professor Olof Johansson Stenman, Professor Bjorn Ilche, and Professor Insil Lee. Thank you so much for taking thank your you. time to be here today. And I will leave the floor and the word and the microphone and uh, the standing pulpit to Ambassador Jakob Hallgren. We can walk this way.
to give some closing remarks. Well, everybody, uh, I hope and I think that you all agree with me that that was an extremely rich and, and fascinating uh, discussion, how economic and social sciences are so intimately tied to human uh, well-being. So I'd really like to, to thank the panelists, Mr. Olof Johansson Stenman, Mr. Byung Il She, and Ms. Insil Li uh, Ji for, for those uh, uh, extremely interesting both presentations and I think also, and I think you agree with me, the discussion afterwards. Uh, I, I think this was a quite a strong case for uh, what was said in Alfred Nobel's will, which is that the prizes, even though this is a prize in the memory of Alfred Nobel, should benefit uh, uh, man mankind. And whether this has to do with how we devise policies as governments uh, uh, which are uh, uh, equal or leads to equity, or whether it addresses some of the existential issues of your, our time, and that was also alluded to uh, within the sustainable development goals, etc. Et so thank you so much for that. Uh, and this uh, uh, draws our second part of today's Mem uh, Nobel Memorial Program and Symposium to, uh, to, to an end. But we're not done yet. In, uh, in uh, a little less than one and a half hours at 1900 here in Korea and at, uh, at an 11 o'clock in the morning in, in, in Central European time in, in Swedish, we will continue and then we will continue with literature, the Nobel Prize in Literature. Quite exciting. So for those of you who are leaving us now, thank you so much. But if you have the slightest interest in literature, please stay tuned and come back to us then. Thank you very much. Kanzamida. Thank you.